And now to end this early section of the Christmas pieces, I will read some selections from the famous chapter 28, Christmas at Dingley Dale, from the Pickwick Papers by the most beloved of all English Christmas writers, Charles Dickens. The novel was first published in 1837. As brisk as bees did the four Pickwickians assemble on the morning of the 22nd day of December. Christmas was close at hand in all his bluff and hearty honesty. It was the season of hospitality, merriment, and open-heartedness. The old year was preparing like an ancient philosopher to call his friends around him and amidst the sound of feasting and revelry to pass gently and calmly away. Gay and merry was the time, and right gay and merry were at least four of the numerous hearts that were gladdened by its coming. And numerous indeed are the hearts to which Christmas brings a brief season of happiness and enjoyment. How many families whose members have been dispersed and scattered far and wide in the restless struggles of life are then reunited and meet once again in that happy state of companionship and mutual goodwill, which is a source of such pure and unalloyed delight, and one so incompatible with the cares and sorrows of the world. How many old recollections and how many dormant sympathies does Christmas time awaken? We write these words now, many miles distant from the spot at which, year after year, we met on that day, a merry and joyous circle. Many of the hearts that throbbed so gaily then have ceased to beat. Many of the looks that shone so brightly then have ceased to glow. The hands we grasp have grown cold. The eyes we sought have hid their luster in the grave. And yet the old house, the room, the merry voices and smiling faces, the jest, the laugh, the most minute and trivial circumstances connected with those happy meetings crowd upon our mind at each recurrence of the season, as if the last assemblage had been but yesterday. Happy, happy Christmas that can win us back to the delusions of our childish days, that can recall to the old man the pleasures of his youth, that can transport the sailor and the traveler thousands of miles away back to his own fireside and his quiet home. But we are taken up and occupied with the good qualities of this St. Christmas so that we are keeping Mr. Pickwick and his friends waiting in the cold on the outside of the Muggleton coach. Mrs. Wardle, said Mr. Pickwick, we old folks must have a glass of wine together in honor of this joyful event. The old lady was in a state of great grandeur this then, for she was sitting at the top of the table in a brocaded gown with her newly married granddaughter on one side and Mr. Pickwick on the other to do the carving. Mr. Pickwick had not spoken in a very loud tone, but she understood him at once and drank off a full glass of wine to his long life and happiness. Then the cake was cut and passed through the ring. The young ladies saved pieces to put under their pillows to dream of their future husbands on, and a great deal of blushing and merriment was thereby occasioned. Mr. Miller, said Mr. Pickwick to his old acquaintance, the hard-headed gentleman, a glass of wine. With great satisfaction, Mr. Pickwick replied the hard-headed gentleman solemnly. You'll take me in, said the benevolent old clergyman. And me interposed his wife. And me, and me, said a couple of poor relations at the bottom of the table, who had eaten and drunk very heartily and laughed at everything. Mr. Pickwick expressed his heartfelt delight at every additional suggestion, 
and his eyes beamed with hilarity and cheerfulness. Ladies and gentlemen, said Mr. Pickwick, suddenly rising. Hear, 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 cried Mr. Weller in the excitement of his feelings. Call in all the servants, cried old Wardle. Give them a glass of wine each to drink the toast in. Now, Pickwick. Amid the silence of the company, the whispering of the women servants, and the awkward embarrassment of the men, Mr. Pickwick proceeded. Ladies and gentlemen, no, I won't say ladies and gentlemen, I'll call you my friends, my dear friends, if the ladies will allow me to take so great a liberty. Here Mr. Pickwick was interrupted by immense applause from the ladies, echoed by the gentlemen, during which the owner of the eyes was distinctly heard to state that she could kiss that dear Mr. Pickwick. Whereupon Mr. Winkle gallantly inquired if it couldn't be done by deputy, to which the young lady with the black eyes replied, Go away, and accompanied the request with a look which said as plainly as a look could do, If you can. My dear friends, resumed Mr. Pickwick, I am going to propose the health of the bride and bridegroom. God bless them. Cheers and tears. My young friend Trundle, I believe to be a very excellent and manly fellow, and his wife I know to be a very excellent and amiable and lovely girl, well qualified to transfer to another sphere of action the happiness which for twenty years she has diffused around her in her father's house. Here the fat boy burst forth into stentorian blubberings, and was led forth by the coat collar by Mr. Weller. I wish, added Mr. Pickwick, I wish I was young enough to be her sister's husband. Cheers. But failing that, I am happy to be old enough to be her father. For being so, I shall not be suspected of any latent designs when I say that I admire, esteem, and love them both. Cheers and sobs. So let us drink their healths and wish them prolonged life and every blessing. Mr. Pickwick concluded amidst a whirlwind of applause, and once more were the lungs of the supernumeraries under Mr. Weller's command brought into active and efficient operation. Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Pickwick. Mr. Pickwick proposed the old lady. Mr. Snodgrass proposed Mr. Wardle. Mr. Wardle proposed Mr. Snodgrass. One of the poor relations proposed Mr. Tupman, and the other poor relation proposed Mr. Winkle. All was happiness and festivity until the mysterious disappearance of both the poor relations beneath the table warned the party that it was time to adjourn. They all repaired to the large kitchen, in which the family were by this time assembled, according to annual custom on Christmas Eve, observed by old Wardle's forefathers from time immemorial. From the center of the ceiling of this kitchen, old Wardle had just suspended with his own hands a huge branch of mistletoe and this same branch of mistletoe instantaneously gave rise to a scene of general and most delightful struggling and confusion, in the midst of which Mr. Pickwick, with a gallantry that would have done honor to a descendant of Lady Tollemglower herself, took the old lady by the hand, led her beneath the mystic branch, and <coughs> saluted her in all courtesy and decorum. The old lady submitted to this piece of practical politeness with all the dignity which befitted so important and serious a solemnity. But the younger ladies, not being so thoroughly imbued with a superstitious veneration for the custom, or imagining that the value of a salute is very much enhanced if it cost a little trouble to obtain it, 
screamed and struggled and ran into corners and threatened and remonstrated and did everything but leave the room until some of the less adventurous gentlemen were on the point of desisting when they all at once found it useless to resist any longer and submitted to be kissed with a good grace. Mr. Winkle kissed the young lady with the black eyes, and Mr. Snodgrass kissed Emily, and Mr. Weller, not being particular about the form of being under the mistletoe, kissed Emma and the other female servants just as he caught them. As to the poor relations, they kissed everybody, not even accepting the plainer portions of the young lady visitors who, in their excessive confusion, ran right under the mistletoe as soon as it was hung up without knowing it. Wardle stood with his back to the fire, surveying the whole scene with the utmost satisfaction and the fat boy took the opportunity of appropriating to his own use and summarily devouring a particularly fine mince pie that had been carefully put by for somebody else. Now the screaming had subsided and faces were in a glow and curls in a tangle, and Mr. Pickwick, after kissing the old lady as before mentioned, was standing under the mistletoe looking with a very pleased countenance on all that was passing around him when the young lady with the black eyes, after a little whispering with the other young ladies, made a sudden dart forward and putting her arm round Mr. Pickwick's neck, saluted him affectionately on the left cheek, and before Mr. Pickwick distinctly knew what was the matter, he was surrounded by the whole body and kissed by every one of them. It was a pleasant thing to see Mr. Pickwick in the center of the group, now pull this way and then that, and first kissed on the chin, and then on the nose, and then on the spectacles, and to hear the peals of laughter which were raised on every side. And when all the raisins were gone, they sat down by the huge fire of blazing logs to a substantial supper, and a mighty bowl of wassail, something smaller than an ordinary wash house copper, in which the hot apples were hissing and bubbling with a rich look and a jolly sound that were perfectly irresistible. This, said Mr. Pickwick, looking around him, this is indeed comfort. Our invariable custom, replied Mr. Wardle, everybody sits down with us on Christmas Eve, as you see them now, servants and all. And here we wait until the clock strikes twelve to usher Christmas in and beguile the time with forfeits and old stories. Trundle, my boy, rake up the fire. Up flew the bright sparks in myriads as the logs were stirred. The deep red blaze sent forth a rich glow that penetrated into the farthest corner of the room and cast its cheerful tint on every face. Come, said Wardle, a song, a Christmas song. Christmas is coming, the geese are getting fat, please to put a penny in the old man's hat. If you haven't got a penny, a halfpenny will do. If you haven't got a halfpenny, then God bless you.